Hello and welcome to Internet Basics. Uh, this is CSCE 242 at the University of South Carolina. My name is Jose Vidal. And at this link down here, uh, you will find the slides that I'm using for this talk. So in this talk, we're going to cover a little bit about the basics of uh, how the Internet works. And uh, mostly, though, we're going to be talking about HTTP, which is the focus of this class, well, web development. Um, so we're going to start uh, with a little bit of history, a quick overview of history. I uh, have this little timeline here. You can go and look at that later on. Uh, so uh, a couple of things I want to point out. 1982 is the time when uh, Vinod Koshla, Bill Joy, Andy uh, Betzelstein, and Scott McNeely found uh, Great Sun. Um, it used to. It was named for Stanford University Network, and uh, their logo back in 1982, or their motto was "The network is the computer." And uh, so back then, 1982, they saw that uh, networks were going to make computers um, more powerful. You know that the power really lies in the interconnection of the machines. And a lot of the ideas that we talk about today, in terms of cloud computing and web applications uh, have been around since then. Right? So these, uh, these ideas are not new. What's new is that nowadays we have the bandwidth. Right? Back in 1982, the internet was uh, very, very small compared to today. And uh, people didn't have high-speed internet connections or really any internet connection. Uh, so the, the ideas didn't go m very far back then, but uh, they are now coming to fruition. Um, so uh, I know that in uh, this is how they look like now. By the way, um, this is 19 back in 1983. Sun hired this guy, uh, Eric Schmidt. That's him back then. And you might know Eric Schmidt is right now the CEO of Google. He was hired there, and uh, you know again, trying to make a vision to finally come true that the network is the computer. And so I'm going to go through, you know, Microsoft, the X Windows, uh, you should read about that, the Macintosh, these are the Steves, um, Microsoft is founded, there is Bill Gates posing, uh, 1980, wait, I missed, Tim, so 1990, uh, most importantly, Tim Berners-Lee, shown here, develops the World Wide Web. Uh, specifically, he develops uh, HTTP and HTML, and creates the first web browser on the web server, uh, which was, you know, at the time only he used. Uh, but uh, pretty quickly, people started accessing his web server, and it became very popular. And then, 1993, Mosaic was written. This was the first popular uh, web browser. Then, 1994, the people who created Mosaic created a company called Netscape. And that was really the first big uh, web browser. Uh, the same year, Yahoo was founded, 1994. And uh, from then, around 1995, is when the internet starts to take off. A few 1996 is when these two guys, Larry, Sergey Brin and Larry Page, get together and create uh, Backrub, which was the uh, precursor to Google. Uh, there it is. And uh, that keeps going through the bubble, and then the bubble bursts around 2000, 2001. And then after post bubble, we have stuff like Gmail, and Firefox uh, gets deployed. And 2005, the term AJAX is coined, and now uh, what we see in some of these web applications flourish. So that's the history. A little bit about the future. Now let's talk about the future. Let's look at some data. Here is a uh, little chart showing. Uh, and the x-axis we have time, these are years, 1995, 2000, 2005, and on the y-axis is the number of internet hosts in millions. So you can see 1995, very small, and that's really when things start to get going. And uh, it explodes, right? So the number of internet hosts goes up exponentially. Uh, you can see here 2000, 2001, this was when the big bubble burst, the dot-com bubble burst, uh, had absolutely no impact on the growth on the internet, it just kept chugging along. Uh, right now we have close to 600 million internet hosts, that's a big number, there's 300 million people in the US, so we have twice as many hosts as Americans. Uh, 6 billion people in the world, so there's still some 
room to grow here, but uh, I expect at some point it's going to slow down. Uh, it seems to be doubling every three years, more or less. Uh, in that, I think it's probably going to go on for a few more years. Um, so the internet is strong and it's growing and it's, it's just becoming part of uh, everything. Uh, the future holds more web applications. I believe web applications are here to stay. Uh, they're not necessarily going to replace desktop applications. They're just going to be the new way of writing applications. Uh, this, this, the distinction between local and remote processes is going to disappear. Right now, you can write applications that run um, partly on the server, partly on the client. Uh, you're going to see a lot more of that, you know, such as Google Earth, for example, not not Google Maps. Google Earth. Uh, you're going to see multiple front ends. And this, this is a common ambition in the cloud uh, where you have uh, uh, your data resides in the cloud and the computing is, is mostly in the cloud, but then you have multiple front ends to your data. You have your desktop, your netbook, uh, your mobile device, your iPhone, your Blackberry, and then maybe a voice or who knows what other uh, front ends. But all these devices that will be able to access your data and you'll be able to share your data in, in different ways of course each one of them has uh, user interface limitations are different and so you'll want different data in each one of them um, but they will all be going back to the same cloud services uh, web services and also semantic markup I believe is going to continue to take off it's just starting to get going right now Okay, so a little bit about networking. I'm not going to go into too much detail on networks because that is a whole other class. Uh, and uh, if you want to write web applications, you should take the networks class, uh, 416, I believe. So well, we're just going to give you a little overview. This is the abstraction layers that you learn about in networking class, application, then TCP IP, then the IP, then the uh, connection, uh, and then the hardware layer. Um, so basically we mostly work at the application layer right? we write applications that use TCP and uh, UDP and, and IP to connect to other uh, sites and uh, so we write on top of that stack we don't necessarily care too much how that works as a uh, web applications developer you pretty much assume that you write a program that can talk to any other machine in the internet uh, but things do break down, so it's important to know how and why and when they can break down. So um, the way TCP IP works is uh, break IP, the Internet Protocol, uh, breaks all your data into packets. And this is a diagram of a packet, uh, basically saying bits 0, 1, 2, 3 hold the version number of the packet, bits 4, 5, 6, 7 hold the header length, and so forth, then bit uh, 32 hold the identification number uh, and so forth then bit I, I guess 128 holds the the source IP address or starting at bit 128 29 and so all the way uh, that is uh, this is the source IP or this is the sender right so a machine this whole packet is sent from this IP or a machine that resides at this IP to a machine that resides at this IP so remember in the internet all machines must have a different IP number that's how we get from um, A to B and uh, each packet looks like this and as part of the packet the packet itself says I am coming from this machine and I am going to this machine and then it gets routed so forth so it works a lot like postcards right, a postcard has a source address when you're a postcard or envelope and a destination address and you just, you can just look at that part and the mailman can carry it and can eventually get it to the destination and this other stuff and after all this stuff the actual data uh, down here it's also the source port and the destination port number we talk about those uh, so, so TCP and IP. TCP, you know about TCP basically guarantees that all packets are received at the other end. The way it does this is by resending packets. So TCP basically, uh, when you want to send a big file, uh, TCP, what you do is you break it down into all these datagrams that I just showed you, and then TCP numbers them. They say this is number one, number two, number three, and starts sending them in order. The other machine at the other end also implements TCP IP. 
TCP and uh, it gets starts getting these packets, it gets packet 1, then it gets packet 2, then it gets packet 4, then it says, oh wait a minute, I got 4, I didn't get 3, can you send 3 back again? And uh, sends that message back, the sender resends packet 3, then he gets it and everything's done. That's how TCP works, basically. And numbers, numbers the packets, and then both sides, you know, the receiver side keeps asking the sender to resend stuff that he didn't get. Uh, UDP doesn't do that. Right? UDP just breaks the message into packets, sends them, and it's done. Um, so it, things get faster. UDP can be faster than TCP, but things can get lost, and you're not guaranteed to get anything. Uh, so UDP is can is used often in streaming applications. If you're streaming video or streaming audio, where it doesn't matter. You know, if you missed a frame, you missed it. Whatever, it will just show the next frame. So s small losses like that don't matter, and all you want is to get as much data through as possible. Uh, that's when you use UDP. Uh, so a little bit of firewalls and, and proxies and routing. So the way a router works, like I said, every machine in the internet has to have a different IP number. And the way they're set up is all machines in a local network have uh, IP numbers that begin, say, with the same three numbers. Like in this case, 129, 252, 13. So all these machines here, we say, begin with the same three number. Maybe this is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So 129, 252.13, 1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, and so forth. Uh, what the router does is the router looks at that number and says, OK, if the packet is going to a machine whose number does not begin with these three numbers, the router looks at that and says, oh, that doesn't belong in this local network. I'm going to put it over here. And uh, that's how router works. Right? So the routers just look at the packets in the local network, and if the packet doesn't belong there, they put it on the appropriate network or one of the next networks. Um, remember that when a machine, the, the local network is a broadcast mechanism, right? So when any one of these machines puts a packet on the local network, all the other machines can see it. That, that's how packet sniffers work. So by design, and there's nothing you can do about it, every packet that you put in a local network is can be seen by all the other uh, machines in that local network. It obviously, it cannot be seen by the other networks. You know, So at the other side of the router, it cannot be seen. But in the local network, uh, it can be seen. And that's you know, a common way that you know, people use packet sniffers. And again, in networking class, you learn all about that. Uh, a firewall is like a router. Um, except that it doesn't just forward all the packets, it makes decisions. So it can, the firewall can, for example, say, okay, I'm gonna look at, and now if a packet is from a machine and it's going to port 23, I'm not gonna forward that. So any any packet that is going to port 23 within my network, I'm not gonna forward that in. I'm, not go I'm gonna block it. Uh, that's a very common rule, and uh, so you can have all kinds of rules like that, where the firewall just decides not to forward it. Uh, proxy is kind of like, uh, it just works at a high level, and it's a go between uh, two machines. Um, so it basically pretends to be the other machine. Uh, client server is what the name of this class. Uh, client server architecture is a high level concept. The idea is that you have a server that provides information, and you have clients that use that information. Um, or does it now extend it to n-tier architectures where you have multiple levels. In web applications, we usually have a three-tier architecture where we have the web client or the browser, uh, the web server, and an SQL database. Right? So the browser accesses the server, the server accesses the SQL database, and then you go back. Uh, so that's a three-tier architecture. You can maybe pump that up to four, maybe, uh, if you have other services. Uh, the domain, the DNS system, uh, you come into contact with this a lot. So the DNS system is the one responsible for translating a name, the name you see, like jmb.csc.edu, uh, into an IP number. I told you all machines must have IP numbers. The only way to route a packet is with an IP number. But you know that you, you don't. You go to CNN.com. You don't go to 124, or whatever. So the DNS is the one. It's the system that takes care of that. It's a hierarchical system, and I don't want to go into the details of how it works. Uh, but you can read about it here. Uh, the main thing to note is that it, it takes time, right? So when you are, when you have to resolve a DNS a name. 
So you have to resolve a name into an IP number. That takes some time. And uh, if you want to speed up web development, you want to minimize that. Um, so you can read about that there. Uh, you can, uh, once a domain name is registered, so if you go to your godaddy.com and register a domain name, uh, your name is going to be added to the Whois database. Um, and uh, in Unix, there's a Whois command that tells you who owns that name. There are also web services like this one uh, that will tell you in information about who owns that name. In this case, sc.edu is owned by or registered by University of South Carolina with an administrative contact of Jeff Farnham. Um, so there you go. And you can get information who owns the name. Um, so like I said, when you connect to a machine, uh, you open a connection, and then that connection can be in various ports. There, are 60, each machine has on their IP has 65,536 ports. Uh, some of them are reserved, uh, especially you know the ones under 1,024. Uh, for example, port 23 is the Telnet port. Uh, port 80 is the HTTP port. That's the one we're going to be using. And uh, 21 if is, is FTP, 25 is the SMTP. Um, so a little bit of uh, on IP numbers. There's some special IP numbers. Uh, this is, you know, by the way, the class C and class B um, IP numbers. So a class C IP number uh, when you reserve uh, anything that uh, the first three bytes. So you have 256 uh, IP numbers. If you get a class B, which you really can't anymore. Uh, you have uh, 65,536 IP numbers reserved for you. Um, there's some IP numbers that are special, anything with beginning with 10 or 172.1 or this one, or more popularly this one, 192, 168. Uh, anyth anything, any one of these four, are, these are non-routable IP numbers. That means every router will drop the packets to or from those. So you can't have networks using those IP numbers uh, in the internet. Uh, anything begini beginning with 127 goes back to the same machine. That's called a loopback. And uh, right now you probably heard we're running out of IP numbers since we only have four digits. Uh, so we're rolling out IPv6 which adds six numbers. So instead of four we have six and that should hold us for a couple hundred years more. Uh, okay, so a little bit of an example. Uh, uh, why this might be this is important to you uh, when doing web development. So here is a typical example of a network, and uh, let's say we have a network here. This is 129.62.12. So all these machines start with those uh, with those three digits to have IP numbers that start with those three numbers. Uh, over down here we have the internet and then uh, this one is uh, say this is you uh, you have your ISP now your ISP when you get you know Time Warner or uh, Bell South or whatever they only give you one IP number right and uh, let's say they give you 62 11 12 3 uh, well you have say two computers and you want to use both of them on the internet so how do you do it and so if you with one IP you can only have one machine on the internet. So uh, the way we do this is with the network address translator. Uh, these now come. This is you know a piece uh, software, but now comes built in into these things here. You probably own one of these, uh, or uh, you certainly know somebody who does, or one of the Netgear ones is also popular. Uh, so these you know you plug in your network, your cable network now modem, back here, or and then you plug your network your computers on the other ones and uh, what it does it it translates addresses so specifically uh, let's say you know this computer here bubbles bubbles is 192.68.0.1 and she wants to talk to Blossom over here so this computer here is going to create a packet and it's that packet is going to have the from IP is going to be 192.168.0.1 it's going to put it over to this network and it's the two address the two IP is going to be this one, point 0.12, point 0.2. So this computer is going to create that packet, put it in the local network. The NAT then is going to take that packet, it's going to look at it and say, okay, that's going in the internet. And uh, but it's not just going to place it over there; it's also going to rewrite the from. 
so it's the from which was 0 0.1 the NAT is going to rewrite it said no this is not coming from 0 0.1 this is coming from 62 11 12 3 and that's the packet it's going to put on the internet so that's going to get to blossom blossom is going to get that packet it's going to think it's stuck into somebody at this IP number 62 and it's going to return that packet when the NAT gets the return the NAT remembers that there's a connection between bubbles and blossom and it's going to again then rewrite that packet and it's going to change the from uh, I'm sorry the to instead of 2.62.11 it's going to say 2 oh no this is 2 uh, 192.68.01 and it's going to send it to bubble so it's it's a works as a man in the middle right so you know, the NAT you know pretends to be uh, you know, gets everything from this guy and uh, sort of uh, Blossom thinks it's talking to somebody at this IP number when in fact it's talking to uh, this guy here. This is the way all home networks are set up. Now, the reason this is important to you is because, uh, say, Blossom is a web server, right? And you have these are two computers here, and uh, say this is, uh, I don't know, Blossom is Gmail right so the gmail web server and you have two computers here they're both two people are each are logged in so there's one person logged in on each computer two different accounts they both want to use gmail at the same time what happens well what's going to happen is when the both of them send their packet to blossom blossom if if or gmail uh if gmail only looks at that ip number they're both going to look like they come from the same so it's not going to be able to distinguish the fact that those are two different connections, right? So what uh, you have to do then is use cookies in those cases, right? So you don't want to use IP numbers because uh, IP numbers uh, really don't tell you what you need, don't, don't distinguish uh, enough. Uh, we'll talk about uh, cookies in a second. So internet, a little bit about internet standards. There's two standards bodies that uh, tell us what you know certify the standards the older one is the in the IETF the internet engineering task force is democratic it's open to everybody and that one you know uh, standardized TCP IP and MIME uh, SMTP uh, a lot of the earlier stuff then after the web was created they they created the World Wide Web Consortium uh, and that one has standardized stuff like HTTP, HTML, XML, and CSS. Uh, these two work differently. The W3C works sort of before the fact. The IETF works after the fact. Meaning that they only standardize stuff that people are already using. The W3C standardized other things such as uh, uh, XML before anybody used XML. Okay, uh, more definitions. URIs. URI, URN, and URLs. Right, so these are three things that uh, we use a lot when building web applications. So a URI is a sort of general idea. It's the general idea of a uh, uniform resource identifier. And it looks like this. You have a scheme colon and some scheme specific part. So it's a very general thing. It just says, OK, and, uh, this is going to be a, an identifier. There's going to be a scheme and then a colon and then some, some other stuff. And the schemes that we use are things like data, file, FTP, HTTP, Gopher, etc. And the scheme specific part usually, but not always, but usually looks like slash slash some authority slash path question mark query. Uh, and then there's two types of URI. So URI is the general idea. And uh, there's two instances of that. You have URNs and URLs. A URN is a universal resource name. Uh, defining this RFC 2141 and uh, it looks like this you have URN colon some namespace and a resource name so a good example of URN is an ISB, the ISBN number so uh, as you probably know all books in the US have a ISBN number if you open the first page you'll see a, a number there which is the ISBN number and uh, that number uniquely identifies that book right so you can create a URN as such. It's a URN, ISBN is the scheme, or the namespace, sorry, and then the actual number. And that is a unique uh, identifier for that book. So it's a unique way to name that book. It doesn't tell you, however, how to find that book, right? It just tells you this is the book, but you have no idea how to get it. Uh, and that's the idea of a URN. It's just some way of uniquely identifying uh, resources, whether they be books or documents or records or movies or whatever. 
Uh, and this is a, a common, we use this a lot, you use this a lot in developing web applications when you have data. Um, so uh, it's already used by the, the document object identifier system, the DOI. Uh, so the DOI system in uh, a lot of uh, pretty much all uh, scholarly journals, you know, so the journals that we researchers read. Uh, if you look carefully, you'll see that somewhere in there, it gets a, there's a DOI number that looks kind of like that. Um, so, and uh, what, whoops, what, uh, what it is is that that number is the DOI.org website here keeps a database uh, where they map those numbers to URLs, right? So I can go there and click through and see that that takes me to the page where that document resides. Uh, I could show you another example if we go um, to my home page here, uh, my library. So it's a bunch of papers. Uh, if I click here, you see the URL down here and there at the bottom of the screen. Uh, this is going to take me to dx.doi.org slash and that number but if I click it that that's actually a, a web service that just all it does it forwards me to the actual web page that holds that article which in this case is under the ACM uh, it could have been like this other example here if I click on that one that one's going to take me to the IEEE digital library uh, so you know, it's a way of naming these so that then it becomes really easy to find them wherever uh, they may be, uh, as long as you have that database, of course, uh, which is kept by the DOI. Um, so, and then so that's the URI, URN, sorry, and then the URLs, you're familiar with those, right? That's the URL. Uh, you might not be familiar with uh, the it's full complexity. So, the full URL looks like this there's a protocol colon slash slash username colon colon password at host colon port then slash path then hash mark a fragment uh, within that file and then question mark and then the query so most of the time you don't have username password right so you just go directly to host so this whole part is optional uh, and uh, but you can have it and so you maybe you've seen it sometimes uh, the port number you, you'll be seeing that you know sometimes you have a non-standard port number meaning not 80 so you have 8080 or 800 or 8000 and so forth but that's that's the full uh, URL okay so HTML is GML and XML uh, we're gonna be talking about HTML later on but I want to give you a bit of a history on these first um, so the first game SGML, that's called the Standard Generalized Markup Language, and uh, it was basically it's a language for specifying what a document is, not what it looks like. So it tells you, you know, this is the title of the document, this is the author of the document, uh, this is the first paragraph, this is the second paragraph, and so on. Not how those are going to be typeset. And it was very popular with librarians and had been around for a while, but it became uh, really complicated, really hard to parse for a computer. So it became really hard to write a parser for it. It became very complicated. And uh, so, but it was around, and the time when Tim Berners Lee was making up HTML, he looked at that, and so he really simplified it. He took a lot of stuff out of it, and uh, he ended up with HTML, what he called HTML, uh, which, you know, what it looks like, like this. We're going to talk about that later. Uh, and uh, the original intention was to describe the semantics, right? That was Tim Berners-Lee's original intention. So he wanted to keep the idea of SG SGML, that this was to talk about, about the document parts, not how things should look like. But the browser developers, you know, Netscape and Microsoft, uh, started just adding tags to HTML left and right. Uh, and uh, so it got polluted. And uh, so HTML you know, version 4.0, version 5.0 is out, or you know, standardized. And uh, so there's a lot of tags that have been added. And what happened is uh, HTML became very hard to parse uh, because a lot of the tags became ambiguous, right? So uh, it became very hard to write a parser for it. So the W3C people, they went out and said, like, okay, let's go back and write. Uh, they came up with XML, 
XML is where well, we're going to take sort of the basic, the raw idea of HTML, which is this idea of having uh, brackets and open tag and a close tag pairs. And uh, we're going to say that you always have to have an open and close, which is not true for HTML. And uh, you can have attributes, but if you do, you, they have to be followed by an equal sign. And then the value has to be between quotes <coughs> and always has to be like that. So they made all these rules that m such that XML is really easy or a lot easier to write a parser for. So it's very easy to parse, uh, unlike HTML and, you know, very simple. So XML is good for machines. Machines can read it really fast. So that means they can interpret it fast. That means that your browser can display the document faster. Uh, and uh, we'll talk about, we also, we're, what we're actually going to talk about later is XHTML, which is HTML, but an HT, a set of HTML that obeys uh, these XML rules. That is very strict about what can and cannot be uh, placed. You know. XML, uh, you know, we'll see later, it's very popular and we're going to be using it a lot too. Uh, mime. Okay. Uh, so back when, before the web, there was email, and uh, people, you know, like to send email to each other. And once they did that, the next thing they wanted to do is send pictures to each other or other documents. They wanted to send Word documents, uh, Word perfect documents in those days. Uh, and because email only works um, in uh, plain text, you can only send plain text in an email message. The only way you could send a binary file was to take that binary file, run it through some converter that turns it into ASCII text, then cut and paste the ASCII text into your text into your email then send that over to the other person with instructions telling the other person okay cut and paste this part into a file then run it through this decoder and then you're gonna get a file uh, you're gonna get a word file or an excel spreadsheet or whatever uh, so what mime you know this was fine but what mime did was uh, automated that or rather it allowed it, it may create a standard that let people automate that process to what we have today where you can just click on it uh, so it basically just says, uh, MIME is just a standard way of saying, okay, this part here is of the part following from here on out is, is actually text slash HTML or is an image, it's a GIF image or is a JPEG image or whatever, and it's encoded in whatever encoding. Uh, there's a standard encoding that it requires. Uh, there's also s types for applications and audio and movies and all different types. There's uh, over 100 types. About yeah, about a hundred predefined types of content, uh, and then MIME is important to us because MIME is used by HTTP, uh, as we shall see. So this is this is the RFC that defines the various MIME types. Uh, okay, so finally HTTP. The a HTTP is the Hypertext Transfer Protocol defined in the RFC 1945, and then 1.1 1 .1 is in 2616. Uh, it's a stateless protocol for fetching MIME encoded information from another machine on the internet. That, that's really all it is. It's just a way of getting data from one machine to another and that data is going to be MIME encoded. The steps are the following. You make a connection, uh, you then make a request which looks like that. And so you type that in, you say, okay, I want this file. You say get index.html and then you give it the, the protocol version number that you're using and then you get your data back. Uh, you have to have two, you know, RN, RN twice after that. Uh, and you can also, these are, like as I say here, optional. You can have other header information, RN, RN, and then you get some stuff back. Uh, if it's a post request, you can do get, post, uh, then you can uh, add more data before the RN, RN, right? So. Uh, after you do that, you get a response back from the other side. The response is a response headers, RN, RN, and then HTML. And then it's going to close the connection. So we can do that um, here on Windows. I'm going to run command. I'm going to run Telnet. Uh, Telnet, if you don't know, is a program for opening connections to other computers, uh, specify port numbers. If you type help, you get some help information. Uh, basically, I can say open, I'm going to go open www.sc.edu at port 80. 
and that's going to open a connection to there and the cursor moves on the, the top here moves over there it doesn't look very pretty but uh, now I can type my command I'm going to type get space slash and then I don't even need to type HTTP I'm going to hit enter and boom I get everything back so that's it and it says connection lost because it closed the connection uh, so which is what we did there is uh, what your web browser does every time I open a connection to www.c.edu I send the command get slash and in that case I'm, I'm asking for the home page and I got the home page back I also got all those headers which scroll by really quickly we couldn't see them but I, I did get all those back so you see that's what your browser does uh, it just automates that and then takes all this HTML and turns it into some pretty stuff uh, so uh, the cookies we'll, we'll see those later those are strings that are sent over here as part of the headers uh, and uh, so we saw get and put uh, so before I move on to talking about these I'm going to show you so I just show you how to do that by hand the talent way but there, there's better ways to do this nowadays uh, what you're going to want to do for this class is you're going to go to getfirebug.com so go there and you have to use Firefox you want to get Firefox if you don't have it yet and install this thing just click there and it'll install Firebug uh, can't show it here but show. there just click on that big button there and install Firebug and uh, what you do uh, what you're going to see after that is uh, oh, I went away I need to uh, I'm trying to hide uh, this guy here um, let's see okay there it is so after you install it you get that fire bug this little bug down here on the right and uh, you click on that and you're gonna get this window I'm gonna make maximize that and uh, you see it shows you uh, you need to become comfortable with this the various tabs you can see if you click on the HTML tab you can see the actual HTML for the page you're looking at um, that's it you can open and close stuff here uh, right now we're interested in the net stuff so the net tab it shows you what happened when I got that page so remember that the slides that we're looking at here this slide here is actually a web page right at this address and I just got it right so the way I got it what the way the browser got it was by issuing a get request so if you open firebug under the net tab you'll see uh, the get request right and uh, so you see the get new request had uh, under the params tab under get um, you see it has a style white so the parameter you notice if you look at the URL you have to go to the end of it it says question mark style equals white right because that's the parameter we send and so that's what it's telling you the headers uh, then you can see the headers here these are down here are the request headers so when I sent uh, the get request I sent these he headers to remember the headers uh, are the, the part that you can send early so you can say get uh, I erased that okay I gotta do that again uh, if I move the page So I'm going to go here. And so right after the get, we have the request headers. Uh, the browser sends these request headers. And uh, they look like this. There's the host, user agent. These are all of them, all the ones that we sent in this, this case. Uh, so we're basically telling the server that, hey, this is the host that I'm talking to. That this is you. 
user agent I'm telling him I'm coming from this web browser Mozilla etc uh, I accept HTML so these are MIME types right, I'm telling the server the browser tells the server that it accepts HTML or XHTML or XML or some other stuff we can see and I accept English language and, uh, and things can be zipped and these are the character sets that I accept uh, a collection is to be kept alive for 300 milliseconds uh, I send the referrer this is the page that referred me to this page that I'm getting and then I send cookies and then the response is here so w before the header is from the response so then the server sent me back this information saying this is the date this is the server that I'm running Apache 2.2 on a Fedora machine uh, the document was last modified at this time uh, there's an e-tag uh, the content length that I'm sending you is 3098 bytes and it's a closed connection and then the actual response is here under this other tab and this is the response is HTML in this case or actually XHTML in this case uh, so that's uh, Firebox it's a great way of doing that let me just do another more complicated example so say we go www.c.edu you go to that page uh, now you open Firebox there under the net uh, you see uh, there's some other stuff there there's not just one get uh, but there's various gets and in fact there'd be a lot more if I hadn't been there already uh, so let me go to somewhere I haven't been to what happens is if you've already been there it's downloaded the file the browser doesn't download things twice right because that takes longer so I'm gonna go to cnn.com I haven't been there on this machine uh, and so I'm gonna do all that and um, I have to enable because it's set by default uh, Firebug is disabled for all pages so I enable for cnn.com and you see uh, a bunch of gets right so this is just one page I'm loading cnn.com slash and then that's gonna so it downloads this page then after that it this you know it parses that HTML and that tells it oh no you're gonna download the style sheet come on the CSS you gotta download this other style sheet and then you gotta download the prototype JavaScript library and you're gonna download this scriptaculous and you're gonna download this other JavaScript library and this one I can tell they're JavaScript because they end in .js by the way uh, so if you look at the end of the file name this is .css that's gonna be a style sheet uh, a style sheet which we'll talk about later and uh, so you see it downloads all this stuff bunch of JavaScript and then it starts to download images right uh, I think so yeah so these are all the images and it's hard to see and if you open any one of these we get back to the headers response stuff you see with images it actually shows you Firebox shows you the actual image right there in a little pop-up and that's pretty nice yeah, CNN.com uh, and uh, you can't fit it here but this this part over here uh, shows you the times again because the resolution is so low uh, for this uh, screencast I can't show you that but uh, yeah still though it tells you zero, zero milliseconds and it took 177 milliseconds to download that data um, so pretty cool so it gives you a lot of information about that transaction so it's not just what happens is one get getting the original HTML file the browser then parses it and then that results in a bunch of other downloads to do, 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 do. Uh, okay so that's Firebug uh, which you will be using a lot in this class um, so and uh, so get is the most common as you saw get is very popular uh, on doing web applications uh, but there's also head head is just like a get but instead of returning doesn't return the content or the body it just returns those headers uh, post lets you post information to the server or upload this is used for uploading files so when you want to send a big file you can't just put it all in the URI because the URI is limited to I think 256 uh, you have to use the post message and then add all your data after that um, so the put um, 
it's also used to place data up there and uh, the difference is uh, well, when we get to RESTful services um, we'll talk about that in more detail but the, the put uh, replaces data right? where post is generally meant to add data delete deletes data so there's there is a delete command that allows you to delete data in the server uh, of course that's not you know you have to have the proper permissions uh, and uh, so these are put and delete are used by uh, WebDAV, if you know what that is. Uh, and then so the headers, I just showed you a bunch of headers. Uh, here's a quick overview of the most important ones, except these are the uh, request headers, meaning these are the ones that the browser sends to the server. So after you do get, the browser also can put any number of these headers. It can say, I accept this media type, so the browser can say, "Okay, I, I only accept audio of this, you know, uh, MP3s, but not Ogvorbis files, or etc." Uh, I can say, I "Accept only this character set," so I only understand ISO or Unicode or whatever. I can only accept this. I accept these encodings. Uh, these are compressed and zip. <coughs> this is very common. Uh, way to speed up uh, your browsing session if you just uh, automate just zip everything at the server side almost all browsers accept uh, gzip and compress so they can uncompress it so basically it makes the whole HTML file a lot smaller and makes the whole experience faster um, so Apache supports this uh, built-in so you just turn it on uh, accept languages, you know what languages you are, you know some of the better websites will have multiple languages although it's still very rare uh, authorisa authorita authorization, uh, if you have username and passwords and you want to include them you can use them here uh, this is the sort of the old unsafe way of doing it because the password goes out in the clear, uh, depends how you're doing it uh, from uh, this is supposed to contain the email address of the human issuing the request it doesn't generally uh, host uh, this is the uh, the internet host and port number of the resource being request so you have to tell it this is the machine I think I'm connecting to uh, if modified since this is good so and uh, browsers will only use that if uh, you know, basically, if I last downloaded this document at this date, uh, and uh, and it hasn't been modified, I really don't, and I have it in the browser has it in the local cache, then I don't need to download it again. Uh, so I can say if modified since this date, um, you know, don't let, don't don't give it to me. So they'll only give me the document if it hasn't been modified. Uh, sorry, if it has been modified uh, since that date. And then the user agent, as you saw, that tells the server uh, what browser I'm using. And then this is very common, and servers will use that uh, to, you know, uh, customize their replies. So if the user agent is an iPhone, then you, uh, the server might want to send back a different reply than if the user agent is, uh, you know, Firefox. Uh, HTTP response, so then the headers that the server sends back are can be the following. Uh, the first thing to know is that the HTTP starts with a response, which is that number, the most popular one. You probably come across this 404, which is page, page not found, right? So the server can say, no, that page that you wanted, that's not found. I didn't find that, so it returns 404. Uh, the more common one is 200, which is okay. Uh, I found it. There are 40 status codes, and again, you probably want to look over those. Uh, and then there's other, there's other <coughs> um, response headers that the server can have, such as accept ranges. Um, so it's basically, the server specifies the acceptance of a range request. So if this is um, the server allows you to download parts of a file instead of a full file. Uh, the age, uh, the, the the age is the time since the response was generated by the server. Um, so the idea here is, you know, this is useful for changing data such as weather and stock quotes. So if you have a web page that gives, you know, the price of uh, a stock. 
you can also include an age that tells you that the server includes an age there that says you know this has been the data has been changed uh, is this many seconds old right so I changed it six seconds ago uh, the e tag is um, it's kind of like a hash uh, that yeah, these are meant to function as unique identifiers for documents so each document in the server can should have a different e tag value so the browser can then use those e tag values uh, for local caching right purposes so it's a way to uniquely identify all the documents in the server such that th you know there might be there might be two different URLs uh, for the same server from which I can get the same document so the same document can be accessible by two different URLs uh, but if they both have the same e tag with it, which they should uh, then the browser is not confused by that and will not download it two times or three times or however many times uh, there are uh, URLs for it uh, the location is uh, when you move so when you move web servers and you move to another domain uh, you can add this one to redirect the user and say no this page is no longer there go to this other page so that the server can return that uh, pointing to the new page and finally the server one tells the client what the server is and you saw that uh, in Firebug Oh, okay, cookies. So cookies are we're added a little bit later, and def they're defined a little different RSC, but they're they're also just another header, as you saw um, before. And I'll just show that again. Uh, I think I got some cookies here, right? There. So you see, a cookie is just uh, this string, and it's just uh, an undecipherable string. In this case, there's actually multiple cookies. They're separated by semicolon. Uh, and uh, so a cookie is just a string uh, but the idea is that the server creates the string and sends it to the use to the client so when the client goes to the server the server creates a string uh, and gives it to the client now the client agrees to send that string back to the server whenever it goes back to the server so it works like a nickname basically the client goes to the server and the server says, "Oh, okay. Here's here's the document you asked for. And by the way, I'm gonna call you Stinky. And uh, after that, every time that client comes back to the server, so the client says, "Okay, get me this other document. And by the way, my name is Stinky. So that way, that's how the server remembers, uh, if you will, uh, everybody. That's the, how the server distinguishes all the various replies and can keep state. So the server can know, oh." can remember okay that's stinky and he has a session and I know who he is and he's already logged in and etc um, so cookies are very important you can turn them off but then there's no way if you turn off cookies in your browser uh, that means that you're not sending those cookies back to the server so every time you go to the server it's like you're a new person so and the server is all you're never gonna be able to log in in most websites Okay, so a little bit of history. There's two other things I wanted to talk about quickly. Uh, the CGI, the Common Gateway Interface, is a very old way of generating dynamic web pages. It's it was the first way of generating dynamic web pages. Uh, basically, the idea is, is uh, instead of in if the web server, instead of interpreting the arguments of the get or post as a file name, uh, it thinks of them as a program and then runs that program with the given arguments. Uh, so instead of a file, the slash part is a program and we're going to run it uh, and uh, so the CGI URL is interpreted as program name and then parameter value parameter value pairs and the post uh, for the post that's for the get and for the post command HTTP command um, we pass you know remember the post HTTP command you can upload uh, a bunch of data so what it is is we run the program program name and then all that data uh, is given to the program as though a person had run the program and typed that information um, so these are used but it was you know very popular early on but it has uh, some serious drawbacks uh, the main one is that the program is run whenever and whatever it prints out it's in no th that's not a problem that's what it does sorry uh, the problem is that the program runs as an independent process 
uh, and uh, that consumes a lot of resources, right? So starting a program is a very consuming process, time-consuming process for the operating system, um, and you don't want to be doing that many times a second. Uh, so they have suffered from these huge startup delays, and uh, it's also very hard to maintain state between successive calls because each time you run the program from scratch. So CGI is not used anymore. We use better ways, and we'll talk about that in, in this class or in the next uh, 590 class. Uh, applets are Java applets. You've probably seen those. Those are Java programs that run on your client, uh, very similar to Flash uh, animations. And uh, it's basically like, you know, you open, I'm sure you've seen these, you, you open, there's a little box in your uh, web page, and that box is like a program, and it runs independently of everything else. And uh, they're fine. The problem is, is really that box that, you know, so you can, with applets, just like with Flash, you, you're stuck within that box. So your program, everything it, d it does has to run within that box. It cannot communicate with the rest of the web page. Uh, and I uh, can't do much, m you know, more else. So it, they just didn't take off because of that. And people they didn't like the box. Um, okay, so. Uh, a few references, so I just covered the main uh, things about HTTP. Um, y you need to, of course, be aware uh, of all the get, put, and post commands and how these work. Uh, I recommend reading the Wikipedia article on HTTP. It's a good, really good overview uh, of it. And there's this book here, which is also very nice. It goes into a lot more depth, actually, uh, and it's, it's really good to read. Uh, so that's it and uh, so I hope you go in what you should do now is go in with your firebug uh, start that up and uh, go start exploring uh, net tab and uh, see all the stuff that you get back from the various websites and the stuff that you're sending to the various websites okay so that's it for today and I uh, will see you in class